Jake Ludington here at HPE Discover in London, and I'm here with Simon Leach. And you've written a book about hybrid cloud security, which is something that I think many people feel security in particular is a, is a barrier to doing anything, certainly in public cloud. Uh, but then hybrid cloud, of course, spans into public cloud. So yes. what, do you, what do you do to make people more comfortable with the idea of putting their data in the cloud? So obviously customers um, understand that as they move into the cloud, security is going to be one of the major challenges that they have to overcome. And in fact, some recent research that we did together with the 451 Research Group showed us that the three main concerns customers had were security, compliance, and data sovereignty. So what we're trying to do at HPE is to make customers understand the type of risks that they're going to be coming across as they migrate into the cloud and to understand the countermeasures that they can uh, implement to, to make sure those risks are acceptable for their organization. Because very often, uh, understanding risk in the organization is not necessarily averting all of the risk, but it's reducing risk to a level where it makes sense and it's economically viable for your organization to still accept or to, to take that risk. And in terms of cloud, we really helping our customers to understand that to implement cloud well, and to implement security well in that cloud, you're going to need to follow a kind of a life cycle. So we talk with our customers very much around application security. Yeah, obviously with cloud and especially cloud native applications, you're going to see a much higher cadence uh, around the release cycle of applications. And with anything that happens quicker, there's obviously more opportunity to make mistakes. And we like to help the customers understand the risks that they will have with these applications and we can position a bunch of HPE tools from the Fortify portfolio to help strengthen those applications as you release them into the cloud. It's kind of important to add security into your software development life cycle so that you understand um, the risks before those risks become real risks. We then also start to talk about the actual data-centric approach to security, which is as the data goes into those applications, make sure it's secure right from the inception point. So start to use encryption tools. We particularly talk about something called format preserving encryption, which is where you take a piece of structured data, you put it into an application, and you encrypt it or secure it in a way that the application can still use the data and it can still pass through the whole life cycle very well, um, but yet it's still encrypted. And then once we've secured the applications and the data, we then start to talk about deploying that to a hardened infrastructure. We have various partner solutions that can, can help with that. And once the cloud is up and running, make sure that cloud um, is in a position to be monitored using a SIM or a SOC platform um, and to make sure that you can meet your compliance requirements, which is really one of the big challenges that customers are faced with today. So in light of that, and compliance in particular, you've got GDPR coming in 2018 for the sure. EU and Theoretically, we're standing in the UK, which may or may not continue to be part of the EU. Yeah. But uh, how does that play into the considerations people need to take now versus waiting until you know late 2017 or, or January of 2018? So, as you say, you know, GDPR, the, the General Data Protection Regulations, they come into force on the 25th of May 2018, and. You know, whether or not the UK still is in the EU at that point, I think is kind of irrelevant because GDPR has been created as a set of regulations to standardise the data transfer of EU citizen data. So it doesn't matter whether you're physically located in the EU, as soon as you're handling that EU citizen data, you need to be GDPR compliant. So, so, so as, as a someone from the United States having a company, I would also have, need to protect that data the same way? You would, and um, specifically for the US, um, they've recently approved the, uh, the EU-US Privacy Shield, which is basically an extension to GDPR, so that a lot of the regulations that GDPR is enforcing are now also relevant to that transfer of your transatlantic uh, data. But there's a couple of important things to remember with GDPR. Uh, you firstly, as I said, it doesn't matter where you are as an organization, it's if you're handling that EU citizen data. Uh, there are also massive monetary fines if you become non-compliant to that. So it can be up to 4% um, of your annual international revenue or 20 million euros depending on, on, on the, the size of the breach and the size of the organization. So there's a couple of steps that organizations need to think about. They need to think about, um, first of all, classifying their data. So understanding where the data is in their organization um, and how they can protect that data, the PII, the personally identifiable information of, of EU citizens. Secondly, they need to think about security by design so that they can actually reduce the vulnerability footprint and make sure the applications they have are as secure as possible to reduce the impact of any breaches. 
but also they have to be able to notify the authorities of any breaches that do happen and one of the requirements of GDPR is to be in a position to uh, to notify the the local data protection authorities within 72 hours if a breach happens to your data and of course that requires a good understanding of your own security position to be able to react that quickly so GDPR is going to see a lot of changes for organizations but I think the the most important takeaway from GDPR is the fact that really GDPR is just about security best practices so regardless of whether you need to be GDPR compliant or not it's a good starting point and we're seeing a lot of organizations starting to take the budget that they're being assigned to become GDPR compliant and just using that budget to become better overall in terms of their security posture. Is it, is that, it fair to say that GDPR is effectively, or, or effectively the government finally catching up with what security best practices should be anyway? Well, I, I'm not necessarily think it's them catching up. I mean, GDPR actually replaces the old data protection directives that the EU put into place in 1995, and that's something that happened 20 years ago. Uh, the problem with DPD was that it just was no longer really relevant in today's data or today's digital environment. So, yeah, they're catching up in, in, in that respect. They're making their, their own policies as up-to-date as possible, and, and hopefully this time it's going to provide a mechanism that will remain up-to-date for some time going forwards. What, and I'm going to maybe take a, a slight left turn here, but so HP's got persistent memory on the horizon as yes. something that's going to be deployed and presumably cloud technologies will, will use that in some fashion. How does that change the way that these security best practices need to get implemented when, when memory is a common point of attack? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that we're working on as part of the machine project, which is where this, this you know, memory-driven computing is, is really coming from. And obviously, one of the very important bases of uh, the machine has been how do we deal with the security aspects of that. So they're do currently doing a lot of work around, uh, for example, system integrity. So making sure the images that you're booting on the machine are secure, are compliant at each level of the, um, uh, of the application stack. Um, and, and really making sure that um, just the, the overall environment that the machine is operating in does become important, uh, does become you know, secure, and doesn't introduce these new vulnerabilities. Because one of the challenges with then introducing any kind of new techno technology like that is that you will introduce new potentials for vulnerabilities. So they're also looking at the memory, and obviously with a shared memory space, it's important that you can keep um, different processes separate and you know, almost in a walled garden, as it were. And all of those things have been taken into consideration with the, uh, with the design of the machine. Very cool. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. My pleasure.